hello everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm Brandon Waltons, the managing editor here at Texas Scorecard. We're joined today uh, with U.S. Representative Louis Gohmert, who's uh, leaving the Capitol, is making a run for Texas Attorney General. Uh, Congressman Gohmert, thank you so much, first of all, for joining us. Well, thanks, Brandon. Great to be with you. So you stunned a lot of folks in sort of an almost an 11th hour decision to run for Texas Attorney General to give up your seat in Congress. Uh, what motivated that decision for you? Well, I never even thought about running for Attorney General until this past year. Uh, I was frustrated with our current Attorney General, who I voted for in 2014, 2018. But in December of 2018, when I'd seen a presentation of evidence of, of uh, voter fraud mm -hmm. in Dallas County, uh, it appeared clear to me as a former judge who used to review affidavits and applications for warrants uh, that there should be enough evidence to get a warrant, seize uh, the, the laptops, the voting machines, the software, the flash drives, uh, of all of that that was involved, mm -hmm. and then start uh, investigating with what was there, what was utilized. Uh, but for some reason, our attorney general would not pursue that. He's pursued other cases, but nothing of the magnitude that I felt like would make him a national hero, mm -hmm. uh, that he, he, if he were to uh, pursue that, find the flaws in the system, then report those, and you'd have states like Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, you know, Wisconsin, others, that uh, Pennsylvania, that would be able to say, wow, this is where the fraud was done and therefore we got to watch out for this in our own systems, and that he could be a national hero. He saved the 2020 election, made it free and fair. Mm -hmm. And he, he pursued some fraud, but it was none of the big stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was extremely frustrating. I didn't understand it. And as time went on, uh, we had uh, last year in, in 20, well, now a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. Uh, seven of his top people that were in charge of areas of the attorney general office uh, that, that Paxton had put there because they were very smart, people of integrity, Republicans, conservatives, uh, people that cared deeply about the state. And to have seven people like that knowing that their boss had a big bully pulpit and they didn't have one at all, for them to sign a letter to the FBI saying, here's what we've seen and know, and we believe our boss is engaged in corruption, abuse of office, and bribery, and needs to be properly investigated. That was huge for those guys. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard last summer that President Trump was thinking about uh, endorsing, I, I called, and he called me right back, and I said, look, I hear you're thinking about endorsing Paxton. And I would just ask, you know, because there's a lot of things you don't know about. I think you and this, the country and Texas would be better off. You just didn't endorse in this one. I'm thinking about running. And I think it'd be better if, if you didn't endorse in this. And he said, well, uh, he, yeah, he told me about that. Said he had a bunch of criminals working for him that he didn't realize they were stabbing him in the back, just like my situation. I said, no, this isn't like your situation at all. You really did have some criminals working for you, and you had a lot of people stabbing you in the back, but this is totally different. These are people of integrity that he hired because of their integrity. And so he said, well, he, he'll take a look. Uh, then two or three weeks later, he endorsed Paxton. Mm -hmm. So I didn't contact him again. I was disappointed. Uh, and then after I was really wrestling, I was hoping that we would have somebody solid that could get in a runoff and uh, potentially win the seat, especially after I uh, was presented a memo done by the attorneys that do research for our senators. Mm -hmm. And it made clear that if 
someone like our attorney general were indicted after he had won the primary, you cannot replace the name on the ballot unless uh, he's getting off because of a terminal illness that was not known before the primary, or it, like John Ratcliffe, he's appointed to a position right. uh, and and it's taken another job, then you can replace it. But if somebody's indicted, uh, you can't replace the name. That's what the research had indicated. And here we have a situation where, and this was, I was surprised. I had in my mind, Brandon, that mm -hmm. that Paxton had won in 2018 with about the same margin as Governor Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Patrick. But on looking back, he won with between 58, 59 percent 2014. Mm -hmm. Then he just barely cleared 50 percent in 2018 at 50.6. Mm -hmm. And so was headed the wrong direction even before his top seven people made these allegations about federal felonies. Mm -hmm. And I know he says he's been exonerated, but uh, from what I'm hearing from witnesses, they're still interviewing witnesses. It's still being pursued. And I was hearing that when a decision had to be made, I had to let people know in East Texas whether I was gonna run or not. Right. I knew I wouldn't have a chance and he, he had seven or eight million dollars in the bank. It looked like from polling I'd seen that uh, George P. Bush, nice guy, Eva Guzman, nice person, both intelligent, but that they didn't have a chance, uh, there may not even be a, a, a runoff. Mm -hmm. And so I just, and I've never made a move in my adult life without praying about it a lot and, and having a peace about it. And I, it would have been nice if I'd had a peace about it, if I'd known last summer what I came to know mm -hmm. in November. But okay, if I can raise a million bucks, then I know I've at least got a shot. Right. And and so uh, on the one hand, you've got an attorney general that I believe is putting the state at risk by running for a third term with the federal investigation going on. And he knows that. Uh, and you have me. I know if I don't win, my political career is over. I'm done. But because I really believe in my heart, if we lose the 2024 presidential election, the Republicans do, regardless who the candidate is, mm -hmm. I think we're done as a republic. Uh, we have seen what Democrats have done just in the last two years uh, by with with COVID, with the pandemic, taking away so many mm -hmm. constitutional rights. Uh, we even have Democrats that are wanting basically a ministry of truth that will tell us what the truth is every day. And anyone who speaks differently from what the, their version of truth is, you can be arrested. And of course, in 1984, if you disagree with the ministry of truth, the ministry of love picks <laughs> you up and right. takes you to their basement and tortures you for days, weeks, or months, until years even, until you agree with whatever the ministry of truth said. I couldn't believe mm -hmm. we were hearing that from Democrats. So I'm very concerned for the country's future. And look, I'm a historian. I've never stopped mm -hmm. studying history. And I know no republic lasts forever. And we're, we're already setting records every day that the republic goes on. Uh, but I was willing to risk any public future at all for me mm -hmm. to try to save Texas so that we can save the United States. You mentioned uh, election integrity, going after uh, election fraud. What are some other things? I want to talk a little bit more about that later. But what are some other things that you would do differently in the office of attorney general versus the current incumbent? Well, for one thing, I would have already taken action to uh, push a case up to the Supreme Court to clarify their Arizona case where they said state and local gov uh, law enforcement cannot enforce immigration law. Okay, I understand that. But Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution 
has the federal government ensuring mm -hmm. both a Republican form of government and freedom from invasion. And we know back over 100 years ago, Woodrow Wilson felt it was an invasion when Pancho Villa had 40, 50 people come into New Mexico and kill some people. Uh, and so he sent General Pershing with the U.S. Army into northern Mexico to track them down. That was considered a very serious invasion. Well, somewhere short of two million people coming into this country illegally, I would advocate and believe is an invasion. Right. And that should have been pushed to the Supreme Court because we have every right. Mm -hmm. When the federal re government refuses to protect Texas from invasion, and that's people coming with COVID, with fentanyl, with things that are killing Americans, where you're having sex trafficking and human trafficking, drug trafficking, and it's these things are, are horribly uh, hurtful to America and not to mention killing Americans. So uh, I think we've got to defend ourselves and I would be doing that. Also, uh, we need to make clear to parents that you have every constitutional right to show up at school board meetings mm -hmm. and protest things the school board's doing. And I would make clear to the federal government, you have no business coming in and declaring somebody a, uh, a, a domestic terrorist simply who's concerned about the education of their child. They have every right to do that. And I would have made clear to Merrick Garland long before now and in court if necessary mm -hmm. to stop what they were trying to do there. And if a school board just arbitrarily decides some parent is a terrorist and they have them arrested, then I would be going after the school board members that abused their criminal, the criminal process. So, uh, and then also one that really got to me earlier before this, this past fall, mm -hmm. there was a request for an opinion from the attorney general about, uh, the gender transition and puberty blocking and, and sex change uh, surgery for minors. Mm -hmm. And that should have been a one day decision, maybe a week at the most. He went four months. And then the decision that came out, uh, try <clears throat> making sense of it. What is he saying? Because he doesn't really say anything. He just dances around. It should have been clear just mm -hmm. as Dr. Paul McHugh, the former head of uh, psychiatry for years at Johns Hopkins, the uh -huh. first place in America to do sex change operations, said, you know, giving a child puberty blocking drugs can have devastating physical consequences, and he believed it was child abuse. It should not be that difficult to determine that sex change for a child are mm -hmm. puberty blockers based on all the available good information from experts, that should not be allowed in Texas. Mm -hmm. And he has done nothing to protect those children. But why do you think it specifically though, I mean, to kind of stick on that issue, yeah. the state legislature at the same time has refused to specifically make child gender mutilation, I would call it, uh, illegal. Yeah, that's a good why term. do you think that is? And how does the attorney general kind of play, play a role in that? Well, I understand there's a lot of money at play, lobbyists that, are in support of, you know, the gender mutilation or, or gender mutilation. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it doesn't matter. The attorney general is asked for an opinion, mm -hmm. regardless of what the legislature doesn't do. Mm -hmm. You've been asked for an opinion. Give your opinion. And from available evidence, I don't know why this attorney general could not protect the children of the, in the state of Texas. What about another big issue that uh, we've seen lawsuits filed on, made their way through the court, uh, is uh, COVID-related mandates, be it the shutdown orders last year, uh, be it COVID vaccine mandates that we're getting from yeah. the Biden administration now. Um, some of it's uh, coming from the Biden administration, but you know, just last year, right, you had state orders that were keeping yep. people in their home exactly. or shutting down businesses. If you're attorney general, how do you fight back against that? Uh, well, first of all, there, there's two steps. 
Uh -huh. And the second one may not be necessary. But I read um, Governor Abbott's order back in April of 2020. And I, I, we met when we both got elected to be district judges at the same time back in 1992. Uh -huh. And uh, we were at a school or orientation for two or three weeks. And I really liked him, a smart guy. But when I heard as attorney general that the governor was thinking about some mandates as the attorney for the state of Texas, I would be going to my friend, the governor and saying, look, I understand you're thinking about mandates. Mm -hmm. um, you're gonna need to be careful Mm -hmm. because you don't have the right to throw out the freedom of religion and allow people to go buy alcohol, but they can't go to church and pray that God will protect our state. Uh, that's going too far. And so let me help you with that so that mm -hmm. we can get it where it's not unconstitutional. And if that failed and uh, mandates came out like the ones that did, then... I would have already warned, if you go out with that, I'm gonna have to file suit because mm -hmm. I don't believe that's constitutional. Mm -hmm. uh, we've never in American history ever, ever quarantined healthy people. Mm -hmm. You know, there's time for quarantining people that are ill to protect the public. And we've never, ever blocked people from going to church. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you, you just can't, put people, make them subject to arrest for going to church. Right. Uh, and so there are other provisions, uh, but you know, that order, you know, you look back because it caught my, mm -hmm. uh, made me look twice, but it said violations of this order are sub subject to 180 days in jail and $10,000 fine for mm -hmm. each offense. Uh, that's serious stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you would send somebody to jail for 180 days, at least consider doing that for going to church, for mm -hmm. a preacher standing up and preaching the gospel in his, his or her church? Um, that I'd have to challenge that. And we didn't hear a peep out of the attorney general. And um, also, we've had uh, some mandates on other things, I would be going to the governor and say, look, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if we can't work it out. Uh, governor Abbott's a smart guy. I think, you know, I would have talked to him first mm -hmm. and hopefully been able to work that out. And what about the uh, the federal aspect then? So the federal vaccine mandates. Attorney General in Texas has filed, uh, I think a number of lawsuits have been party to them. Uh, would you be doing anything differently uh, if you were mm -hmm. in the office right now? Yeah, I, I would hope that we would do a better job, mm -hmm. but some of the suits he's filed, I, I would certainly have done the mm -hmm. same thing. But on federal mandates, uh, a lot more should have been done. Mm -hmm. It should have been pushed harder. Uh, these drugs, in fact, mm -hmm. I may have, I, I, I'd been carrying around a uh, warning from one of the vaccinations. Uh -huh. And it's outrageous. It's, it's about this big mm -hmm. and it's completely blank except for the name of what the vaccine is. And then um, for emergency use authorization only. Mm -hmm. And because it's emergency use authorization, you don't have to warn people. Now, I think one of the greatest developments and overlapping freedom and health care mm -hmm. was called informed consent. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a judge, I've tried cases like that. Uh, a health care provider has the obligation to advise any patient of potential risks inherent to a procedure or a jab, whatever we're, you're thinking about, and once the warnings are all given, potential risks, and how that would rate to your own biology, your own healthcare problems and all, uh, then that patient gets to decide, do I wanna risk that? 
and then make a decision, yes or no. And especially since we're seeing, well, turned out Fauci was big time wrong about the vaccinations. They don't last. You mm-hmm. can get it. You can die with it. In fact, there were numbers from England the last three months or UK mm-hmm. that indicated 81% of the people that had died in the UK, it had been vaccinated, fully vaccinated. Well, people ought to be able to make their own decisions about that. And so I would have pursued that, you know, with real vigor because Mm -hmm. there are people, thousands of people have died right after getting the vaccination. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is wrong. And I think this is going to be one of those times in history, unless we move into a ministry of truth that rewrites all the history every day. Mm -hmm. Uh, People, Which maybe we're moving towards. <laughs> that's what we're moving toward. But if that doesn't happen, that we're successful in saving Texas, saving the union, saving freedom, then people will look back on this time going, they put their U.S. constitutional rights mm-hmm. in such jeopardy. It all nearly ended right here. But thank God there were people that were willing to stand up and fight for freedom so the government didn't take over every aspect of our private lives. One uh, thing that I, I've heard from folks, I'm sure you've heard something similar, is you know we see these lawsuits, these big lawsuits get filed mm-hmm. against, say, vaccine mandates or, or, or some of these other big issues. And then you've got to kind of wait and it takes a few months and maybe a judge agrees, maybe a judge doesn't. The question is, you know, is there anything else that can be done, right, other than kind of going to a judge and and asking for permission. Is there any other way to fight back on some of these issues, especially for a state uh, like Texas? Yeah, well, a good example, I think, is the, uh, you know, the Court of Criminal Appeals ruling that they Mm. don't think the attorney general can prosecute voter fraud. Mm -hmm. Well, they're wrong about that. And if you read the opinion, you go, who in the world is writing this stuff? Uh, you know, in law school, I won an award for brief law review article, uh, and uh, and my mother was eighth grade English teacher. So, mm-hmm. as long as she was, well, almost uh, as long as she lived, I, she was my English teacher, and she would browbeat me on different things. And it, it troubles me to see things that aren't well written, mm-hmm. aren't well considered. Uh, so, in that case. We elect our judges. It's time to elect some new Court of Criminal Appeals judges. Mm -hmm. Let's get people in that understand the Constitution, understand their role, and don't say something as stupid as, since the Attorney General is part of the executive branch, he or she cannot prosecute. You know, what? Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's one thing. You can elect new Court of Criminal Appeals Mm -hmm. judges. But for another thing, you can do what I've already been doing, and that is talking to legislators in the state legislature mm-hmm. about legislation to fix this. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it it may take a constitutional amendment to the state constitution. We have voted those in. It's not as difficult as the federal, but that's one of the things that could be done. But there are other things that I think could be done and would be constitutional in the way of legislation uh, to ensure that we had our laws being protected Mm -hmm. in our big cities where some DAs get elected uh, based on their refusal to prosecute some crimes. Uh, And you don't find them going after Democrats engaged in election fraud. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are things that can be done, elections, changing legislation, Mm -hmm. changing the Constitution as a last resort. But we ought to be moving forward on all of those bases. Uh, So uh, before we kind of wrap up here, looking at the campaign right now, the Republican primary elections on March 1st Mm -hmm. uh, of this year, uh, you've got uh, your opponent, Ken Paxton. Of course, you've got George P. Bush and Amy Guzman as well. Um, How do you see this race shaping out? Is this something that you think will go to a runoff? Yeah, I think it will go to a runoff. I think it'll be me and uh, Ken Paxton in a runoff, mm-hmm. and that's where I would uh, expect to and hope to win. But one other thing that he didn't do, answer that question, mm-hmm. and about mandates, mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned the lawsuits. Sure. The lawsuit 
that catapulted our attorney general to national prominence was when he sued swing states for changing election law by means other than the legislature mm -hmm. that violates the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and just a couple of days before Paxton filed that suit, I'd gotten a call from the AG over in, in Louisiana. He's a, a good friend. We were in Congress together. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, we need an attorney general of a state to file a lawsuit against swing states that violated the U.S. Constitution by changing election law by other than their state legislature. And we don't need Texas to file it because your state changed some <laughs> election law mm -hmm. that wasn't by the legislature. Governor should have called a special session, got that fixed, but that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So if Texas were to file it, it would be thrown out either early or late because you can't sue somebody for doing exactly what you did. Mm -hmm. That's not a successful lawsuit. But because there had been so much bad publicity about the seven top people filing a uh, referral for criminal charges against our attorney general, he needed to change the narrative. So he filed the suit, which meant he destroyed the suit just by being the one that filed it. Now, when Jeff and I went on to talk, we were talking about, well, let's try to get Alan Wilson in South Carolina, attorney general there to file it, the great guy, son of Joe Wilson, who was uh -huh. in Congress with me. And South Carolina didn't change any election laws except through their legislature. Let's let's work on Allen, see if we can get them to file it. Make, you know, just a couple of days later, our attorney general jumped in, and I don't even think he had somebody in his office file it. He was so anxious to change the narrative. So uh, that's something I wouldn't have done uh, unless I'd gone to the governor, secretary of state, and guys, we can't change election law unless the legislature does it. If you do, I'm going to have to file suit. Mm -hmm. Please don't make me do that. Let's do this constitutionally. Let's have a special session if you want to change the election laws. Mm -hmm. and that didn't happen. Uh, for folks who want to uh, follow your campaign and want to help out, how can they get in contact? What, they, what can they be doing right now? Well, they can go to my website, gomert.com or gomert.net. I have both <laughs> of them now. G-O-H-M-E-R-T dot com or dot net. And you can help out. We need volunteers. We need donations. I'm fighting an awful lot of money. And um, I, I'm feeling good about Everywhere we go, we get tremendous encouragement, mm -hmm. and I think uh, things are looking good that I'll be able to fight to save the state of Texas and the United States of America. Thank you so much again, Congressman. Thanks, Brandon. You made it to the end of this video. You're probably one in a million, but since you're here, make sure you go to texasscorecard.com to find more journalism and commentary, all things pertaining to Texas. Make sure you also like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and hit the bell. That way you can be notified when new videos come out. Thanks.